In the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked, he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. Let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the day in which you blessed us with. We thank you so much, Father, for your many wonderful blessings that you give us every day. Father, we thank you for the greatest blessings being those spiritual blessings that exist in your son, Jesus. Father, we pray you'll be with us this morning as we worship. I pray that everything we do and say will please you well, bring a smile to your face and an honor to your name. And for those who need our prayers this morning, for those who don't feel well, we pray for them. For those who have lost loved ones, we pray for them. And for those that may be away from us, pray for them as well. Father, help us always to do your will. It is in and through the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And I believe that's 175. Let me get my thing out of the way. 175. Morning, Doc. 173? Okay. Thank you, bud. I would blame my contacts, but that's bigger bigger font, so I can't do that. 173. God of our fathers, whose almighty hand leads forth in beauty all the starry band of shining worlds and splendor through the skies our grateful songs before thy throne arise thy love divine hath led us in the past in this free land by thee our lot is cast be thou our ruler guardian guide and stay thy word our law thy path our chosen way from wars alarms from deadly pestilence be thy strong arm our ever sure defense thy true religion in our hearts increase thy bounty is good nish nourish us in peace refresh thy people on their toilsome way lead us from night to never ending day fill all our lives with love and grace divine and glory lord and praise be ever thine Amen. Thirteen. 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 Again, the Lord of light and life awakes the kindling ray, unseals the eyelids of the morn and pours increasing day. Oh, what a night was that which wrapped the heathen world in gloom. Oh, what a sun which rose this day, triumphant from the tomb. 
This day be grateful, homage paid, and loud Hosanna song. Let glad us well in every heart, and praise on every tongue. Ten thousand different lips shall sing, oh, hail this welcome morn, which scatters blessings from its wings to nations yet unborn. 240. 240. 240. Holy Spirit, faithful guide, heaven near the Christian side. Gently lead us by the hand, pilgrims in a desert land. Weary souls forever rejoice while they hear that sweetest voice. Whispering softly, wander, come, follow me, I'll guide thee home. Ever present, truest friend, ever near thine aid to live. Leave us not to doubt and fear, groping on in darkness drear. When the storms are raging sore, hearts grow faint and soaps grow o'er. Whisper softly, wanderer, come, follow me, I'll guide thee home. 376. 376. 376. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven, heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy. Joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the coast is found, far as the coast is found, far as, far as the coast is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders, wonders of his love. Father, we thank you so much that you sent your son into the world. And because he came into the world, there is joy because you see, we realize that he had to die so that we might live. And Father, we thank you that it is through his death that we get to live because he didn't stay dead. We now have hope. But Father, to think about what it costs to take care of our sins, it is truly humbling. We thank you that he would never let us forget that we have a memorial every first day of the week to take that bread at this part. And as he did, we take it in thankfulness, knowing that he gave his body for us. 
and that we are to do this in remembrance of him. Please help us to do that at this time, Father, and it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. One hundred eighty four. One hundred eighty four. God is the fountain whence ten thousand blessings flow. To him my life, my health and friends, and every good I owe. The comforts he affords are neither few nor small. He is is the source of fresh delight, my portion and my all. He fills my heart with joy, my lips attuned for praise, and to his glory I'll be full the remnant of my days. We continue. Thanks, Father. When Jesus took that cup, he emphasized what's in it. It's the cup of redemption. He never had to take it. He never did. But he looks forward to the communion one day in which we will have with him. Father, we thank you that he shed his blood, that he allowed his blood to be shed for the forgiveness and the remission of our sins. Thank you for the memorial. This do in remembrance of me. That's in dire intention, Father. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Two hundred forty nine. Two hundred forty nine. How precious is the book divine by inspiration give. Bright as a lamp, its precepts shine to guide my soul to have. Holy book divine, precious treasure mine. Lamp to my feet and a light to my way to guide me safely home. It sweetly cheers the drooping heart in this dark veil of tears. Light to my life it still imparts and quells my rising fears. Holy book divine, precious treasure mine. Lamp to my feet and a light to my way to guide me safely home. This lamp through all the tedious night of life shall guide my way. Till I behold the clearer light of an eternal day. Holy book divine, precious treasure mine. Lamp to my feet and a light to my way to guide me safely home. Would you please mark 356? 356. We'll use that as a means of encouragement this morning. If you'll turn to Ephesians chapter 4, 
I want to publicly thank Brian again for Wednesday night. Thank you. Uh, they appreciated it more than I did because they got a break from me. And, uh, but no, seriously, I appreciate you, you doing that. We are talking about in Ephesians chapter four, one question. The question is, does truth really matter? The one thing that always, always the devil wants is for us to be confused about truth. In fact, he wants us to be so confused about truth that the old television show used to give us young people in my, when I was in school, this idea, I'm so confused that it makes people just give up. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, God is not the author of confusion. So we know who the author of confusion is. But as you look at Ephesians chapter four, it is in response to the great things that he tells us in the first three chapters. And it's hard to imagine that this would be happening in the church. But you got to remember that the world operates differently. And sometimes the world operates and, and influences us. And he makes one statement that you just look at and all of a sudden you go, what in the world? Verse 25, put away lying. Don't lie to each other, but speak truth to his neighbor. Now that simply means that I only speak truth to our neighbor, Tyler, Tyler and, and Christiana, or that only means that I speak truth to the neighbors across the street. You know, the, no, 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 no. Jesus answered that question in Luke chapter 10. Who's your neighbor? It's anybody. And can you imagine in the Lord's church, they were lying to each other. I don't know what specifics they were, but he did say, verse 25, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor because we are members of one another. Now, sometimes that truth hurts. I get that. I've already told some of you about the time I went to the doctor and, and trying to get a little relief from my from my stomach problem. And when she told me I couldn't have coffee for 30 days, that, that was just almost fighting words, but she was telling the truth. It was all, it was worse than no red or green chili for 30 days. Now, anybody that doesn't live here doesn't even know what that means. My, my family thinks that I'm absolutely nuts because I think red and green chili is the only way to go. They think it's chili powder, meat and beans. <sighs> okay. But the truth sometimes hurts. But does truth really matter? Well, let, me ask, let me ask it this way. When George Washington said, our first president, truth is ultimately going to prevail. Where there is pains to bring it to light. Now, I know that's hard for us to believe. And George Washington probably would say it's hard to believe in our saturated media I, I will tell you that that I've already heard so many things in the election of 24. I wished it was already November 7th. <laughs> I wished it was already the end of it. Because you don't know who's telling you the truth anymore. You used to kind of know. But when social media came along, Oh my goodness, you get one that that uh, there's a there's a video. I didn't even know this was out till yesterday that there's the ballot of Joe Biden. Look that up on YouTube. It's hilarious. Then there's, then there's, oh, did you see what happened to Trump? And one of the bad things Trump did. I can know, I can tell when somebody hates by who they are promoting or not promoting. That's how bad we've gotten in this country. And so the question is, does truth matter? Well, let me tell you about our brother in Christ, President James Garfield. President Garfield, one time he was going to worship and the Speaker of the House and the Senate Majority Leader showed up to his off to the Oval Office, or excuse me, not the Oval Office, but showed up to his office because we didn't have the Oval Office till Teddy Roosevelt. And, he, and they said to Mr. President, we have a major, major problem. We got to address the budget. And President Garfield said, we're not going to address that budget until I get back from the most important appointment of the day, and that's worship. 
He was our brother in Christ. He is our brother in Christ. And he was assassinated in 1881. And he says, the truth will set you free. I love this part of it, but it'll make you miserable. It will at first make you miserable. Because there's some people that just don't want to listen to truth. There are some people you would think would, would obey the gospel, would obey truth. But just like a friend of mine, a friend of my granny's told me one time, or told her, and she told me, she says, Dwayne, you know what people tell me? And I said, no. She says, I know the church of Christ is right. But you see, I was born a Baptist. I was raised a Baptist. I'm going to die a Baptist. And you know what? I know I'm going to hell. And I, you, you just, well, if you know you're going to do that, let us at least talk about it. Nope, nope, nope. I know we're wrong, but that's the way I want it. <laughs> And you'd sit back wondering about people. Floyd and I have talked about this before he died. He says, you know, there are people who have heard the truth and heard the truth and heard the truth. And they just don't do anything about it. He said, he said, it makes you wonder if they don't fit Hebrews chapter six. Yet those same people were the ones that always made fun of us. Because we adhere to scripture and we adhere to uh, that's do you know that silly thing in the worship service you guys do every Sunday that Lord's Supper? Did you hear me? That silly thing you do? And yet every time they meet, they give, so I would always put that back to them. Even Gandhi, who didn't believe in Christianity but but knew he could get along with Jesus, said, even if you're a minority of one, the truth is still. The truth. My favorite paradox is a philosopher by the name of Epimenides. Epimenides adopted the philosophy that says, whatever you say, there's no truth in that. And so people would go around in his day saying, you know, there's no such thing as absolute truth. So he says, there's no such thing as absolute truth, but there's no truth in that. There's no absolute truth, but there's no truth in that. And he just drive people crazy. The truth matters. When you go to court, do you say to the judge, when you put your, either raise your hand, you used to put your hand on a Bible. We don't do that anymore. God forbid. And, and, and you go, do you swear to tell the lie or do you swear to tell the truth? And what's the penalty for not telling the truth? It's a thing called perjury. Matt Locke and Perry Mason were always good at telling people, do you know what the penalty for perjury is? I always cracked up about that because I thought the judge was supposed to say that, but okay, what do I know? But the truth really does matter. The truth really does matter because first of all, it's the foundation for all our spiritual weapons. Look at Ephesians chapter six, please. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says that we have a spiritual foundation. Every part of the weaponry is based on this one part. If you don't have it, you don't have the rest of it. And that is you have that belt or that girdle of truth. First time I read that, I went, I don't wear a girdle. What are you talking about? I didn't understand the passage, okay? Now, Jerry Clower said he always wore a girdle till he got back to his hotel room. Then he let his fat waller wherever. Okay, I, I didn't know that, but okay. But that belt holds up everything else. You can't have righteousness without truth. You can't have faith without truth truth you can't have the helmet of salvation without truth and incidentally where's the helmet of salvation right here not here here why did god why did paul do that why did the holy spirit tell it because that's what we need to keep in mind oh i know the greatest horror i have of my life it's not that god lied it's not that i don't get it it's the fact that do i really have eternal life do I really have the forgiveness of sins? Because you see, it makes no sense to me. You see, I know what I did to the Savior. 
You can have the forgiveness of sins, but me, I don't know, I'm not sure about that. I love what a friend of mine told me one time. He says, Dwayne, the problem with you is you're just like the rest of us. You're too hard on yourself. Serves me well, but sometimes it is, he's right. But you can't have any of those other things. And by the way, you can't have prayer because where are you going to learn about prayer other than that truth? Oh, I know. Chuck Swindoll said it best when he said, we know we, our greatest problem with prayer is we think we're talking to air. We think we're talking to air. I mean, nobody is talking back to us. Oh, I know there are people who try to tell you you need to listen to God. And I, I'm not saying God doesn't speak. That's not the point. But sometimes we get it in our head. Wait a minute. If God doesn't do what that preacher said or God didn't do what that television guy said, maybe God's not God. Be careful. The devil uses anybody and anything to get to us. But see, this is the truth. This is the truth right here. Not what I think it says. Not what I believe it says. Not what I want it to say. See, uh, I'm kind of like the, the jokes that I used to hear. You know, the first Bible, the first car in the Bible was a Honda, right? Because the Bible says they all came in one accord. That's not really true because they didn't have accords, okay? They didn't have Hondas. Or I, I like the other one that goes with it. You know, the first meal in the Bible was a buffet because Paul said he buffeted his body. That's not what it says either. He disciplined his body, buffeted his body. And those are funny, but be careful. Be careful because that truth really counts. Number two, it's the gospel. Now, what is the big deal about this? Ann Murray, in 1982, sang a song that everybody jumped on. I did. I, I enjoy the song to this day. And the song is called, We Sure Could Use a Little Good News Today. There was a publication Paul Harvey said, the late Paul Harvey said, there was a publication that decided to take advantage of that. And they charged 75 cents for a magazine or a big magazine that just had nothing but good news. It lasted six months. They put it in subscription form in addition to another one. It lasted only another six months and nobody wanted to hear good news. We say we want to hear good news. We say we want to hear this. But do you realize the word gospel means good news? It's good news. But we don't tend to want good news. And we don't want the facts. We want the sensationalism that goes with the facts. I didn't really realize this until... We were in an admin training one day, and I couldn't figure out where three of my fellow administrators were. And guess who got picked on in the meeting? They shoved that microphone and camera in my face and said, well, now, how, do you, how does the, uh, the school feel about all those kids getting shot in your school? I went, because uh, 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 I didn't know what they were doing. They, they set me up. And the point was, news is not interested in, in the facts. News is not interested in all of this other stuff, except they want the drama. Because drama sells. I can tell you confidently, you probably know this, but I'm going to tell you confidently. Who gets into more fights over social media, boys or girls? Boys will turn around and go, okay, we got into it. So what? Girls, oh, you know what? You remember what happened about 20 years ago? This is why guys don't like being married sometimes because like the, his, the man, man and the wife that went to the marriage counselor, she's historical. He said, you mean hysterical? To, no, 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 I mean historical. She remembers every bad thing I've done to her for the last 40 years. Aren't you glad God doesn't operate like that? You see, I know who operates like that. 
You can look at World Video Bible School, and forgive me, I cannot remember the attorney's name, but he's a member of the church, and he did a wonderful presentation. And you pretend that you go to court, you're going to go to court one day. The judgment day. And you would think that the prosecutor would be the same as the judge, but it isn't. God is the judge. But who's the prosecutor? It's the devil. And he's got all these notebooks, if you will, on this imaginary table of all the things. You, he's like Bruce Almighty. I was watching a little bit of that last night. And, and he says, there in that file cabinet right there is everything you've ever done. And all of a sudden, Bruce Almighty pulls that drawer and it goes from here to the Chevron. And then God pulls out the file and says, well, this was a very interesting. You blame me for this. And then all of a sudden he, he hits the file cabinet and goes right back. That's the devil. He remembers every bad thing, not good thing, bad thing you've done. And he wants to make sure God knows it. But when you're a child of God, you got the greatest defense attorney. And that's Jesus. And just like he told Zechariah, told uh, Satan in Zechariah chapter 3, he's going to tell the devil the same thing. That's my child. That's my son. That's my child. Gospel is good news. It is what gives us the truth. It's what helps us. It's what guides us. You go to 1 Timothy 2.4. What is it that God wants? He wants all people to come to the knowledge of what? The truth. Well, what's the truth, people? It's this book right here. That's what he wants. Oh, I know. I've got so many friends. My mother and I were talking about this yesterday. One of my aunts. She wasn't ready to go. She thought she was. She thought she was ready to go. But see, one of the elders... Of the church told her she was committing spiritual adultery and she didn't understand that she thought he was saying that she was cheating on my uncle Othel which we all knew that wasn't true and he didn't clarify it he used the wrong words oh I'm not excusing the preacher or the elder but I'm telling you my aunt wasn't ready to go when she died sounds cruel and mean doesn't it but it's absolutely true because what she refused to do was to come to the knowledge of the truth. She refused it. Number three, it's our sanctification. Aren't you glad that we've been sanctified? Go back to chapter one of Ephesians, verse one and two. He says to those saints, well now, you mean we're, we're the equivalent of St. Patrick? No, we're better. St. Peter, we're equal. Saint, saints, now we don't go around calling ourselves saints. And we've adopted the world's definition of being a saint, somebody that's perfect. But what did Paul say there in chapter one? He says, to the what? Saints who are at Ephesus, you and I have been set apart. You and I are better than LeBron James, Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Wilt Chamberlain, and Bill Russell all put together. And I gave you five of the greatest basketball players in the history of the world. As children of God, we've been set apart from the world. We have to live in the world. Second Corinthians chapter 6 tells us to come out from among them and be separate. But what is going to sanctify us. John 17, 17, sanctify them by thy what? Truth. Well, what's truth? You know, sometimes we're like Pilate in John 18, 36. What is truth? Your word is truth. That's what the truth is. And 1 Peter 3, 15 says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. So that when someone asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you, you'll have an answer. Sometimes we've, we've just abused that passage. Sometimes we've said it, made it say things that isn't true. 
for example, we're supposed to be, you know, we're supposed to give an answer for everybody. No, that isn't what he said. We're ready to give an answer. I had a discussion with a man for a whole entire week about things of the church. But the reason we're supposed to be ready to give an answer is for that hope that's in us. For that hope that's in us. Folks, that is our sanctification. So if you will, you can go around calling yourself St. Flossie, St. Doc, St. Brian, St. You know. Because that's who we are as children of God. We're not going to be saints. We're not, we don't have to do this posthumously as our Catholic friends teach us. We are made saints right then and there when we obey. Number four, it's our standard of doctrine. We've talked about this on several occasions. But go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let me give you the traditional. And then let me give you what it really means. Because what I found in my own world is I can say that word, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, and go, what does that mean? That means I got to spend long, intense, laborious hours. And trust me, I can on word studies. But is it going to benefit you? Not necessarily. But when, for example, here's where we get things mixed up. Uh, Prentice Metter, the late Prentice Metter used to preach at Preston Crest in Dallas. And one of the most powerful statements he ever made was, if you take the text out of its context, you make a pretext. In other words, you make it say something that it does not say. So, for example, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. Money is the root of all evil. And people, and I've heard preachers just criticize money and criticize money and criticize money and, cri and they condemn money and condemn money. And then you got people in the world who are condemning preachers that have got money. And everything. is that what the text said? No. If it's wrong to have money, God's wrong. Because who owns it all? God. That's not the problem. The problem is the love of money. Let me give you another one. There are people who go around and teach, once you're saved, you're always saved. And the reason they teach that is 1 John 1, 7. The problem is they misunderstand 1 John 1, 7. If we walk, that's a present tense verb. And I've had friends of mine condemn the church uh, church for years and years because we don't believe in eternal security. That's not true. We do. But we have to respond to that. I want to ask you a question. Let's suppose, well, let me back up. Uh, Friday morning, I heard one of the most disturbing things. And I said, I never want that to happen to me. And that is, there is a tick that is going around that when it gets in your body, it produces an allergen to meat, to red meat. I said, oh my goodness, never eaten a steak. I can't handle that. But let's suppose for a moment that you take me to wherever, Texas Roadhouse, Cattleman's, and you tell me, you're going to order me a porterhouse and you're going to order all of it. And that gets to the table. And I just sit there and go, sure looks good. And you go, something wrong with it? No, no, thank you. What's your next question? Why aren't you eating it? Because you see, I don't deserve it. I, I, I don't. I don't understand how steak works. I don't understand how that, that got on the grill and, and I don't understand. And, and, and besides all that, I'm not going to eat it anyway. Would you be insulted? Last time I knew cattlemen's is $47 for a porterhouse. 
let's suppose I take you to the Texas Roadhouse or the the Big Texan in Amarillo. That 72 ounce steak is still available. One gal finished two in nine minutes. I'm trying to figure that one out, but they filmed her doing it. Truck driver. That big around. And in case you don't know what I'm talking about, the Big Texan has in Amarillo, Texas, if you eat a 72 ounce steak, salad, beans, and baked potato in one hour, you get it for free. And where that started, it was Cowboy Bob Lee would have these ranchers come in payday and they'd get these big steaks and some of these guys would finish five and six steaks. It's no kidding. So he created what's called the, the big, big, big steak. You get kids that go in there, no, no. I have a friend of mine that's finished it four times and he's about that big around too. But let's just suppose you go in there and you order it and they, they start the time at 60 minutes and you don't eat any of it. You're not gonna have to pay for that, are you? Yeah, you are. It's about $70 for the steak, which isn't bad considering 72 ounces. It's the gospel is our standard of doctrine. Go to chapter two, verse 15. Study to show thyself, be diligent to present yourself to prove of God. Now, why is this so imperative and so important? Because even Adolf Hitler realized you can, people can be influenced easily. They created parties, literal parties in, in the swastika party to influence the Germans to say that everybody in the world is inferior to German people. They fed their people LSD before it was created. And they literally would influence the German people, show them movies just like we do in the United States. Who was always the big bad guys or big good, uh, big bad guys in, during World War II? It was the Germans, it was the Italians, it was the, uh, it was the Austrian Hungarians. Who were the good guys? Those were the Americans. You know, you got the patents. And you got those guys. And designed to influence. Guess what? China is currently writing a version of the Bible. And it's anti-God. Now, how are you going to know whether or not they're telling you the truth? <laughs> you got to get in the book. Oh, I know it'll come to nothing. That's not what I said. Gamaliel taught us that in Acts 5. But when you get a Bible written that God is gender neutral, that there are 72 genders in this world, the Bible says there's only two. And yesterday, Christopher and I saw some somebody. I, I had to look twice. This guy got out of his car. He's got a beard. He's got a mustache. He's got rings up here, rings here, rings here, and he's wearing a skirt. And you know what he's telling, what he told me? He didn't tell me this physically, but what he told me by volumes, don't you dare call him a man. At best, call me an it. I'm not an it. You're not an it. You're a person. Where did we go so wacky? That's going to end too, I know, because like Vince Gill says, we're all waiting for the next big thing. 2 Timothy 3.16 says what? Every scripture, every scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired of God, and it's profitable. What's the first one say? For doctrine. For doctrine. Aren't you glad you don't have to write this? Can you imagine what it must have been like for about 75, 80 years at least that Judah did not have true doctrine? No wonder Josiah did what he did. When they found the, when Hilkiah found the book of the law and he read it, 
Josiah led the people in repentance, in a nationwide repentance. They got things, I mean, the, the people were given right and left to, to rebuild that temple. We live in a country where we have at least one Bible in every house, maybe collecting dust. Excuse me, but we got a Bible in every house. When's the last time you read it? When's the last time you looked at it? When's the last time you really looked at it? I know. I know what's so easy to do, what I used to do. I don't have time to read that. I don't have time to read this. Besides all that, it's so difficult to read. So hard to read. I don't remember everything I read. Well, guess what? You don't remember everything you read either. If I ask you to start categorizing what you did every day this past week, I assure you, you won't remember everything. Because I don't either. Get in it anyway. And the reason is it's going to be the standard of judgment. The very interesting illusion, there's a very, not illusion, I'm sorry, very interesting vision that God gives the fig picker, Amos, in Amos chapter 7. What he gives him is, he gives him what's called a plumb line. We didn't realize it, but if you'll stand at that door, when we remodeled this building, we didn't use a plumb line. Until and we didn't realize it until afterward. You stand back at the back or front. I've never figured out if that's front or back, and you'll see that that baptistry is off by about three inches from the top. So everything else doesn't look right. It looks distorted. So if I put things in the middle, guess what? It's not going to look right. Now, what did God say in Amos chapter seven? He says, "I have set." A plumb line. That plumb line is to be followed. In other words, you want to know the center? Follow the plumb line. Here's your plumb line right here. Here's my plumb line. This is it. Because it's going to tell you what you need. Now, go back to 2 Timothy 3 for a second. We've talked about it many times before. But one of the many reasons I love the word of God is because it doesn't, doesn't tell me when I'm wrong. I do not like going to the doctor and just being told I'm wrong. I told somebody the other day, I know something's wrong with me. I just can't figure out what it is. And they said, well, you didn't want to come back to school. Well, I never wanted to come back to school. That, that's not the problem. There's something else wrong. I don't know what it is. But, but I, nobody can find it. Okay? I go to the doctor and do all the things the doctor tells me to do. Oh, no, we don't find anything wrong. Okay, fine. That's good. Good news. But this is going to tell me what's wrong. And it not only tells me I'm wrong, but it tells me what I got to do about it. That's discipline. See, the one thing my dad and mom had to learn was you don't just tell a kid he's wrong. Tell me what I got to do to do what's right. And a lot of parents made the mistake of telling their kids they're wrong, but never would tell them what's right. I loved a friend of mine, and he's not doing very well spiritually. But when he told his son, his five-year-old son, what's the magic words? And his son goes, abracadabra. And he said, I didn't have the heart to correct him. He said, because those are magic words. What do we teach kids? Instead of the word, please. It's our standard of judgment. John 17, 3 says something very intriguing in John 17, verse 3. And he repeats it again in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7 through 10, talking about Paul. Judgment is coming to people who, first of all, do not know God. Who do not know God. If you didn't know me, and you brought me a, a pack of strawberries, I probably wouldn't be mean and cruel by telling you, I don't like those things. Get them out of here. I probably would take them and then give them to my wife and kids. But if you forced me to eat it, I probably would. But I don't like them. I know what I'm going to get 
when I go to the patio and get a salad and I know what I'm going to get, because if the rest of them get a salad, I get mushrooms. I like mushrooms. We used to go to Pizza Hut and, and I'd pretend I was being mean to Adele by taking the sauce away from the breadsticks. Then she spoiled my whole entire fun by telling him I don't like the sauce. He's just pretending. But how do I know that? Because I know her. She knows me. Floyd used to say, I know my wife's hungry when she wants to go to McDonald's. And that was Joanne. <laughs> she didn't want to go to McDonald's. How do you know God? You know God by getting in the book. Oh, I just don't believe God could send anybody to hell. God is not going to send anybody to hell. That's true. What did you just say? God is not going to send anybody to hell. That's true. He's going to honor the choice they have made. And if they have chosen not to do what he says, guess where they're going to go? To hell. Now, I know that sounds mean. And I know people do like one lady turned her hearing aid off one time in a church service. But we shouldn't view that as bad news as much as we should use it as an opportunity to teach somebody. You see, I'm not a Christian today because I love God when I started. Now, don't get me wrong. I love God. But as I told a friend of mine, I am so afraid of hell, I don't even want to be cremated. I go by that crematorium when I, go, when I take somebody in, and I think about that statement all the time. I don't want to go anywhere near fire. There's nothing wrong with cremation. There's nothing wrong with getting that at all. That's not the point. You know what my friend's afraid of? My friend has claustrophobia. John Ortberg put it best in one of his books, his grandma taught him how to play Monopoly. Said, I got good at it. But he said, the one thing grandma always taught me was when the game's over, it all goes back in the box. And when I said, when I said that, my friend went, Ooh. somebody says, you're afraid of, you're afraid of, you're, you got claustrophobia. She's just the idea of that lid coming down on you just gives me the creeps. Now, are you going to know that? Obviously not. Are you going to, is, is there anything wrong with being cremated? Absolutely not. Somebody asked me one time, says, well, how's God going to put that body together? Let me tell you what, how'd he put it together the first time? I have no idea how he put it together the first time. What makes you think you can't put it back together? makes you think you can't put it back together and here's what is so neat this book will help you get ready to go home this book will help you get ready to go home and the reason is god wants you to go home i want you to look at galatians chapter 5 verse number 7 Now, Paul had good things to say even about the Corinthians. He had good things to say about the Ephesians. He definitely had good things. His, his love church, his, his sweet church was Philippi. He had good things to say about the Colossians. His first two books, First and Second Thessalonians, he had good things to say. Philemon, he had great things to say about he and Onesimus. But he couldn't say one good thing about the churches at Galatia. He didn't have one good thing to say about them. And here's why. Galatians 5 verse 7. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying, what's that word? The what? The truth. 
Now, here's what's wonderful. As far as we know from history, churches of Galatia, they were in a region and a district. They all repented. They all did what God wanted them to do. But who hindered you from obeying the truth? I know who ultimately hinders us from obeying the truth. I'm like Mark Twain. I've quit this job a million times. I've quit my teaching job a million times. I've wanted not to live over a million times. Because it's just life just gets the best of you and gets the, and you know, you go on with all that. But I want you to think about one individual that answers that question for you. But see, I have I have the individual in mind, in my head, who kept me, who hindered me. Not not no, he didn't say who kept you from obeying the truth. That's not what he said. He said, who hindered you? Who made it difficult? Who made it extremely difficult? And the answer to the question is, I don't know who that is, but it wasn't God. It wasn't Jesus. It wasn't the Holy Spirit. Let me repeat something my mother said that she didn't really realize what she was doing. And she said, son, I almost left the church. I said, what happened? She said, so-and-so really chewed me out this morning. And I said, what to chew you out about? Well, I didn't vacuum one part of the building. That's members of the church for you. And she said, I was so mad, I was ready to go. She said, in fact, I told him, there's the vacuum cleaner. You want it done, do it yourself. She said, probably shouldn't have said that, but you understand. And she said, I finally sat down, calmed down. And she said, I'm not about to leave. They're going to have to run me off. I said, why is that? She says, because I realized something. The Lord didn't do that. They did. The Lord didn't do that. Satan did. And what does he want? Where does he want to see you? Where does the devil want to see you? He wants to see you in hell. Where does God want you? He wants you to go home. I've been trying to get that song that's in some of the racks to where we can sing it. And I can't seem to get it off my computer correctly. But it, to me, it rates right up there with how great thou art. And that is when I go home. In the moment he appears, in the moment he appears, every, every fear, every doubt's going to go when I go home. And he walks me through and shows me my new home. Oh, when I go home. Man, I'll tell you, every time I hear that and sing that song, it just sends chills up and down my spine. Because you see, folks, I'm like my grandma. Last words out of her mouth. I want to go home. How about you? We're going to sing. A song of encouragement this morning because that's what he does. Satan's not going to call you. Satan's not going to invite you. Only the Lord. He wants you and he wants me to go home. Oh, can you imagine what heaven's going to sound like? Let me close with one thought. We, we've gotten so small in numbers that... We used to have a special choir we'd sing for funerals and got so few of us. And so we've resorted now to either congregational singing or we've resorted to, to not even having any songs anymore. And so my granny died. And I'd always told her I was going to preach her funeral. And she said, that's fine with me. But you do this and you do this. She gave me instructions. 
So the day before the funeral, Dad's going to lead singing. And, and I can see he's frustrated. I said, what are you frustrated about? He said, well, I'm trying to find one more song that'll fit. And you know your granny. You know mama. She wouldn't want anything sad. I said, oh, that's the easiest thing in the world, Dad. I said, what do you got? And he told me. And I said, oh, come on, Dad. Come on, Dad. You know. You know which one would fit her perfectly. And he goes, well, which one? Often I'm hindered on my way. But I'm so heavy, I almost fall. Then I hear Jesus sweetly say, Heaven will surely be worth it all. And almost in a Garth, Garth Brooks look, he did this to me. Got it. Got it. And that's what we sang. As we went out the door. This morning if you're here. Heaven's going to sure be worth it all. But maybe there's something we can do to help you. We'd love to do that as we sing. Jesus is tenderly calling the home. Calling today. Calling today. Why from the sunshine of love wilt thou roam. Farther and farther away. Falling today. Calling today, Jesus, he's calling, he's tenderly calling today. Jesus is calling the weary to rest, calling today, calling today. There my burden and now shall be blessed, he will not turn thee away. Calling today, calling today, Jesus, he's calling, he's tenderly calling today, Jesus is waiting, oh, come to him now, waiting today, waiting today, come with thy sins at his feet, lowly bow, come and no longer delay. Calling today, calling today, Jesus, he's calling, he's tenderly calling today, Jesus is pleading, oh, listen to his voice, hear him today, hear him today, they who believe on his name shall rejoice, quickly arise and away. Calling today, calling today, Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. 951, 951. Majesty, worship his majesty, unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own anthem's race. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Majesty, worship his majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Father, we do adore you and love you because not only of what you do for us every day, just who you are, we thank you so much for your thoughtfulness, your demonstration of love, and you loved us first because we didn't love you first. 
We didn't see anything lovable about us. Sometimes we don't today, but you do. And Father, thank you for de demonstrating that love. Be with all who are here this morning. We thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you. And we pray that everything we do and say pleases you well and that we've done that this morning. Continue to be with us. Forgive us of our sins. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here this morning. Uh -huh.